Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Carl Hafer. I'm the director of the Rotman Institute of Philosophy. And on behalf of the Institute and Western University, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Bas von Frossen, our 2014 Rotman lecturer. When I started studying for my PhD at Stanford in 1986, Bas von Frossen was already considered one of the top few, or more likely the top, philosopher of science in North America. His 1980 book, The Scientific Image, had set the philosophy of science uh, community aflame by offering a maddeningly brilliant defense of scientific anti-realism. That's the view that most, that, sorry, that we should not believe what our best scientific theories tell us about the unobservable parts of the world. For example, viruses or magnetic fields or protons. We should not believe that what those theories say is true. And let me just repeat that uh, for those of you who are not professional philosophers, in case you didn't get it. Um, we should not believe everything that our great scientific theories say about the world is literally true. Now, generally speaking, we philosophers of science do what we do because we became enchanted at some point with science, uh, one or more of the sciences. We think the sciences are great, um, possibly the greatest achievement of humankind. So Professor von Frossen's book was not received, shall we say, with universal love and admiration. <laughs> But the clarity and intelligence of his writing and his reasoning were so compelling that despite thousands of articles and dozens of books written to oppose his views, they still stand today as the paragon of anti-realism in the literature, required reading for each new generation of philosophers of science as time goes on. But there's vastly more to Professor von Frossen's prodigious, uh, prodigious written works, however, than just his work on the realism-anti-realism issue. Personally, my first encounter with uh, Professor von Frossen's work was via his first book, An Introduction to the Philosophy of Time and Space. Um, we both share a kind of a, a, a sentiment in our hearts, at least, for relation, uh, in favor of relationism and against absolute space and time. And my second publication as an assistant professor was a review of his 1991 book, Quantum Mechanics, An Empiricist View. He was extremely kind to me after reading my uh, review uh, much more than I deserved as I came to realize when I grew up professionally a little bit more. Professor von Frossen made his mark in his early career as much in philosophy of physics as in general philosophy of science. And he has also made important contributions to philosophical logic, philosophy of language, philosophy of probability, uh, theory of rationality and decision theory, and a wide variety of important issues in general philosophy of science. Professor von Frossen is the author of seven books and over 2,000, sorry, 200 articles. <laughs> 2,000 would be a little too much. He has taught at a surprising number of excellent universities, including the University of Toronto, Yale, Princeton, the University of Southern California, and most recently is at San Francisco State University. During his time in Toronto, he visited Western University frequently and even acted as a visiting professor in some courses here. Professor von Frossen has, as you might expect, won just about every prize, medal, and accolade that a professional philosopher can aspire to win, and he served the profession in numerous positions throughout his career with astonishing energy and dedication. This brief description of his philosophical and professional achievements is woefully sketchy and incomplete, but to try to give you a more accurate picture of Professor von Frossen's works, I'd have to take up a lot more time, and that time will be much better spent listening to our guest himself. So I'll just say a couple of more things before asking Professor von Frossen to begin. His two most recent books, The Empirical Stance and Scientific Representation, Paradoxes of Perspective, are both connected with the topic he'll be speaking on this evening. Professor von Frossen is interested in our capacity to represent things in the world with our theories and our models, and in certain paradoxes and intractable problems that arise when we reflect on what we're doing when we make these representations. Tonight, he will be discussing a particularly intractable issue, one that arises time and again in the history of philosophy in one form or another. Can we completely represent the mind of a thinking human being, such as ourselves, with the tools of science and logic? Or do puzzles and paradoxes arise that somehow keep ourselves from falling fully into our own representative grasp? I'm very much looking forward to Bosman Frossen's lecture tonight, so please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Much, Carl, but you know, I think science is great too. You know? <laughs> um, 
Yes. Okay, we're not going to get into that issue. So I'm, I'm beginning with a quote from Sartre, and that's not because I want to begin with existentialist premises. In fact, this quote, this quote is really for the end of the paper. But there's two things that I want to point out right now. Um, first of all, the passage is in the first person. The word I is crucial there, and I'm going to come back to that. And secondly, what this passage expresses is how we seem to ourselves. So this is what I'm going to begin to talk about um, in the first part of the paper. How, what is, how do we seem to ourselves? And I'm especially pleased to be doing it here at the University of Western Ontario. Um, this, this morning, I came, I came back here after quite a long time. It's been quite a long time since I've been here. Uh, this morning, when the taxi drove me in and I saw Bureau in college, suddenly a wave of nostalgic memories just came over me because this was the great place for philosophy of science uh, in the 70s when I was nearby. And um, I want to thank you for bringing me in again and especially for letting me indulge in this nostalgia for a moment. Um, so, let me say something more still before I begin. This is I, um, I am going to talk on an existentialist theme, but I am an analytic philosopher. So I'm going to approach this subject, which I think uh, is um, more typically the subject of an existential philosophy, with the means and methods of the analytic philosophy that I so to speak, grew up with. Right? Um, so if I'm going to come to great difficulties in the course of the talk, it's I hope I hope it will show you that these are difficulties that we come to go within in analytic philosophy, in analytic philosophy of science and of mathematics and of okay. okay, that was a preamble. So let me start. Um, part one is about how we seem to ourselves, and the part two will be uh, about rather how we could seem to someone. Um, how do we seem to ourselves? Well, there is an impression that I have. Does it sound a little bit off? There's an impression that I have about myself, which is that whatever I am thinking or feeling or doing, I can be reflecting on it at the same time. I can step back from it. I can realize that I'm thinking at the moment. And of course I can step a little bit farther back. I can realize that at the moment I'm reflecting on the fact that I'm thinking, speaking, and so on. And this is a freedom that we have. Um, it can be quite evaluative. I mean, I may dislike what I'm feeling at the moment, or to have some negative judgment on the thoughts that are running up on me. Um, or, on the, or on the contrary, I can glory in them. Um, this is a large part of what it gives us the sense of freedom that we can have this detachment. So let me just put a little slogan. Isn't that a, a sound coming back at me? <laughs> um, a little slogan. Let's say um, I'm detached. Just in this sense, you know, to have a technical term for it for a moment. It doesn't mean that I feel detached or that I feel neutral, rather. I'm detached in the sense that I am rather step back from what I'm doing all the time. I'm aware, I can reflect on it, okay. But, of course, that can very well be a universal truth. I mean, there are moments when I'm not detached at all. Uh, Sartre gives the example of someone who's running for the streetcar. Uh, running for the streetcar, just focused on is this car going to leave before I get there? Not at all reflective. I mean, no discursive reflective thought about it. Now, it's not that he's not aware of what he's doing. He knows very well that he's running for the streetcar. Okay? But it is not what Sartre calls empathic awareness. Um, at that point, there's only the, what you might call the lowest level thought that is actually pathetic, that is actually explicit. Right? And it stops there. But, of course, in a way that is true always, because even if I reflect on the fact that I'm running, 
and then become quite introspective and say, why am I always reflecting on the fact that I'm reflecting on what I'm doing? It comes to the point that it stops, right? So there's some point when, where that you might call the top level at which I'm not detached at all. You are making a signal to me. Oh, that's the old Now, in an equally warranted sense, I'm never entirely detached. There's always a point at which there's no further explicit awareness, no further formulation of what I'm doing. So, let me try to reconcile these two insights that both seem important. Um, well, I am potentially detached from anything that I'm thinking or feeling. Potentially in the sense that I, whatever I think or feel, I could be stepping back from to reflect on and formulate for myself and express for myself. And as far as I can see, at least the way it seems to me, there's no limit to this. Well, there's a limit in, you know, I may fall asleep. Yeah. But there's no limit in principle of where this comes. That's how it seems to me. That is how I seem to be to myself. But is it really true? Is it really true that I would always be able to express for myself what I was thinking, feeling, doing, no matter how far up the reflection went? There's a very strong empirical claim here about me when I say that. I have this inkling of unlimited richness in of possibilities in my reflective life. But is it true? Now, this is where I, I want to caution us. Um, how we seem to ourselves, well, that's a very, what should I say, initial attempt at forming a conceptualization to, to, to form a coherent concept of what we are like. Right? But this is just where we have to be very cautious. I mean, that's the subject of Kant's paralogy. And, um, I, you know, I have to admit that I don't like the first part of the critique, the analytic, it just gets me totally bored. But the second part, the dialectic, I absolutely love. Because that's where Kant is criticizing metaphysicians, and often quite funny about it. Um, and when he begins the dialectic, um, when he begins the paralogisms, um, he has this, you know, he gives us this caution. There are arguments. By means of which we conclude from something that we do know to something of which we don't even possess a conception. We think we do, but that doesn't follow that we really do have a conception, uh, to which we nevertheless, by an unavoidable illusion, describe the objective reality. So this is a caution against falling into the illusions um, that the metaphysicians had drawn us into. Uh, in the pre kantian times, and that he himself had fallen into, and that, I would say, uh, are an equal danger today. So, how am I going to press this apparent insight or inkling or intuition that I am potentially detached with no limit? Well, let me do it by thinking about language. After all, if I'm talking about this kind of reflective detachment, I'm talking about a reflection that I can formulate. This, when the man is running for the streetcar, he's aware that he's running for the streetcar, but he's not expressing it in, a, in, a, in an explicit thought. So when we're talking about reflection, we're talking about discursive thought, which I would take to be real only if it's expressible in language. So this will have to be an exploration of language in order to press, to, to, to push, uh, this insight to see if it is really true or not. Um, so, suppose that in fact, suppose that in fact I am potentially tested at this. Then I'm able to express to myself reflections on anything that I could ever think, feel, or do, including reflections thereon. Um, whatever I come to think, I possibly reflect on, and the reflection I can formulate, express in language. Okay. That's what the supposition means then, right? But how can 
we understand that? Well, there's several possibilities. Okay. I, in fact, two possibilities I can see. And I will begin with one, see how far it takes us. Namely, this is true because there is, at least in principle, a language such that everything that I can say, I can express in some sentence of that language. But if the language is like that, I'll call it a universal language. So, if it is, you have the supposition that I could, in principle, express anything I came to think reflectively, discursively, explicitly, and here's my possible ex explanation of this, or explication of this. Well, that is, in my, that is at least in principle a language in which this could be done. In this case, I call this a universal language. Um, I'm going to um, now perform a little trick. It's an, it's an old trick, an old magician's trick, and it's just a simple example of a whole panoply of, of tricks they have at this point in order to attack this idea of a universal language. Um, you know, it used to be, of course, I would draw a rectangle on the blackboard, but now, PowerPoint, I'm drawing a rectangle to show you something. Okay. I'm going to have a thought about the rectangle. The thought that I have about the rectangle is that nothing true is ever written in the rectangle. Now, that would be a true thought. For example, if I don't find anything in it and I just dump it out, then it's certainly the case that nothing true is ever written in the rectangle. Right? It's the thought that could also be false. If I write in a 2 plus 2 equals 4, then something true was written in it. Right? But now, look, that thought that nothing true is ever written in the rectangle is a thought I can stand. So if L is a universal language, then there's a sentence of L in which that thought is expressed. So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to quickly wipe that sentence of L from the rectangle and then wipe, wipe everything off. Okay, I'm going to do it. I'll do it very fast. <laughs> you want to see it again? <laughs> okay, question. <laughs> what I wrote, what's what in the rectangle? Uh, was that true or not? Well, you know, the only thing that was ever written in the rectangle was this sentence sun. Right. And, um, so if it was true, um, then what it says is the case, which is nothing that was ever written in the rectangle is true, but that's a contradiction, and this is a supposition that it's true, and then it's not true. What it says is not the case. On the other hand, if it's not true, the only thing that was ever written there, if nothing true was ever written in it, so what Psi says is the case was true. So we have a contradiction. This would be a sentence which is both true and not true. That's impossible. The typical thing is very often only written, only presented in the simplest possible form. Each answer implies its own opposite. So if this is the right explication of what my intuition or inkling wants, that I am potentially attached to that limit, then that intuition was clearly wrong, was in fact self-contradictory. I had too high an opinion of myself when I formed this concept of myself to match how I seemed to be to myself. There is no such language as this kind of universal language. There is no such language as hell. But you know, we are not uh, at the end of our tether because that wasn't the only possibility. Um, if I say anything I could ever express, sorry, anything I could ever come to think can be expressed in some language, you can't just turn it around and say, therefore, there must be some language in which everything can be expressed. It's a possibility, but it certainly doesn't follow. So let's instead think that it means that for anything that I could ever come to think, there's some language in which it can be expressed. Okay. Well, let me try and draw some distinctions about language here. At the moment, I have a language. 
language which is very much like the language that we have. You know, we are limited. We are finite. We have a limited and finite history. This language, the language I have now, is limited. I think it's finite. I mean, it's finite in its resources. Um, so I'll call it my language in Haku. But we know that I can expand and enrich this language. I can form semantic assent. I can form new concepts and bring in words that become that are newly in, um, assimilated into language, that come to be part, come to be part of the family, so to speak. The language can be enriched in many different ways. I have these resources. So do you, so we all, I'm speaking for all of us here. Right? So this language in Haku that I have now is just the beginning of a whole sea of possible enrichments of that language. It can, become, it can become many different things in the course of history. It can never become what already earlier I called the universal language. That's impossible. But I can claim that whatever I can ever come to think could be expressed in some such development of the language. So here's a few possible languages in up to. Uh, I'm just here on the left hand side at the beginning, let's say, and then you see a language that you can do tomorrow, or that you can do next year, and so on, all these different parts. And, what, and I claim, to honor my intuition, that whatever I could ever possibly want to think could be expressed in one of these languages. But you see what I'm doing now? I'm talking about this entire tree of possible languages that I could have. Can I do that? Well, no, because if we admit that possibility, then we can just pull the rectangle trick again. Right? Um, we would put in as a sense that would come to, that would amount to something like this. Nothing to is that expressible by the sense that some language on the tree is ever, ever written as rectangle. It would be the same thing all over again. Right? Um, if this is ever expressed in any of these languages, right, we will look at to see how it will take together. So, this is not going to happen either. The way I seem to be to myself was to have intellectual riches of a sort that turned out to be highly possible. That my intellect was unconstrained and unlimited in certain respects seems to just have to be false. But, um, at the same time, if I were to say there is something that I could come to think that is not expressible in any of the languages that I could come to, that also doesn't make sense. Because whatever I could in fact come to think would be something I could express. So we really are caught in a paradox about a repeated journey. Okay, I want to make a crucial point here about first person language. The problem that I arrived, I arrived at was there because I was speaking in the first person. I was speaking in the first person, not about, say, some arbitrary subject. In fact, I could say consistently, without any contradiction, that anything that Chris could ever come to think, he would be able to express in language. In some extension of his language in Rakhu. The qualification is that I can express propositions that he cannot, because they are propositions exactly about all the ways in which his language can develop. So, if I say this about someone, I'm consistent. If I put it in first-person language, I, I'm no longer consistent. And now, you know, it's at least the logic that we are taught in ordinary logic course, uh, suddenly, you know, a bit, I think that's a little bit dicey because why can't they argue something like this? I can consistently say this about Chris and not just to Chris, but just about anyone. Now, if you can say something about a random person, then logically you can apply the rule of universal generalization and say, therefore, it's the case for all. And then you can say, oh, I'm one of everybody. So let's universally 
differentiate for me an I from a contradiction. So now, ordinary logic doesn't give you five the first person language. We have to start thinking about that. We have to think about what is so different about first person language in which you attribute yourself a tribute. That is so different that the ordinary logic would just lead into contradiction. And, you know, I can even try to say the opposite. If I, as I said, if I said something like, there are things I can think that I could never express in any language, uh, well, then I've forgotten what I mean by think. I reflect, which is supposed to be a person. So, it appears that I cannot really conceive of the limits that I have, and I can't even say that there are no limits, not even say that there are such limits. I've come up against the limits, but there's no way in which I can actually state them without contradicting myself. <laughs> it's a predicament. You know, this very apparently to begin this very simple-minded way of trying to get a coherent of construction just seems like a complete failure. And I don't know how I can now discriminate from my imagination. Um, let me try and give an analogy, but I'm afraid it's all to be a rather crude analogy that doesn't really do justice to this, but maybe helps the imagination a little bit. Um, imagine uh, an orange suspended in space. And there's an ant walking around on the orange. Now, there's no place where the odd where the ant comes up against a, a barrier so he can't go any further. No, no. He can keep walking in any direction he likes. Okay? In that sense, he's not limited. But us looking at the situation say he's very limited. Because, of course, we are looking at it in a two-dimensional context and say he can't get off the orange. Um, you know, something, something a, a little, little bit more complicated, and therefore a little bit better analogy happened in the 19th century when Gauss began to realize that um, we could make internal measurements that would show that Space was not Euclidean, that the curvature of space was not zero. So, of course, we could not in any way be in a four dimensional space to see the shape of our space. But from within, we could come to results that would just, if we, if we tried to have an Euclidean geometry, we just get a contradiction. Um, the ant, if the ant is not proven mathematics, could make similar measurements and say, oh, Gauss shows me how to show that my cur the curvature of my space is, is not zero. And then, nevertheless, we would not have the insight that we do when we look at it in our three-dimensional context. I don't know how good an analogy is, but I think it is at least goes a little way to showing how it might be that the language we live in right, is one within which we can come to paradoxes when we try to conceive of what is the problem. So that it can pop up in certain ways. Even though we cannot step outside it, so we have a language, as long as we choose the first person, right? A language in which we can express that. Um, it's um, a very curious situation because this contact between first and third person language becomes crucial at that point. So this was the first part of my paper. Um, I think, I hope that there's lots of ways in which you are dissatisfied with this first part. Um, I mean, how would I reason this? That's a very abstract condition, really, right? What does that mean? I was thinking of myself in the way that Descartes thought of himself uh, as just a disembodied intellect, leaving aside the fact that, hey, what am I? Uh, not even six feet tall, a finite organism, a piece of nature, embodied, right? I have limitations, and I talk about what could be, what could be the case in languages in principle extended over infinite development. I'm not talking about myself at all. <laughs> no. A scientific model of a person, of a cognitive agent or subject, is not going to be Descartes' model of an 
the end of the day to that. So we have to do something in a different way. The city box goes to develop a coherent self perception that is memorialistic. Now, as you know, um, the, in public economy, this is exactly what is done, right? Models are made of public subjects, public public agents. So I'm going to try and take the same subject again and say, what would it be like for a scientist to represent a person with language and with beliefs you know, in a model that does not depict that person as a disembodied individual? So that will be second part. Let's start again. Um, here's what the challenge of acceptable limitation. So I'm going to imagine a scientific investigator who's going to represent the subject with language and with beliefs. And to make it a realistic possibility on a scientific model, we will not take a subject to have greater resources than insensible computer people. It's not too much of a limitation. In fact, you know, uh, supercomputers have some capacity that we definitely don't have, but maybe not intensive, right? Uh, a bit more. What would the model be like? Well, again, um, the model of the cognitive agent shouldn't give a kind of godlike power to this agent. Um, any uh, loss or introduction behavior would have to be expressed in a computable function. And that just means that there could be a mechanism that uh, explains the, the, um, you know, what, the, what, what the subject does in response to input, right? Um, and the investigator, I'm going to call the investigator theta. And the investigator subject, I'm going to call omega. And theta wants to construct a model of the subject omega with language and beliefs. And, okay. The language is not totally impoverished, that would make it very trivial. Um, the language is the sort of language that you would study in an ordinary logic course, uh, just as I say about it, has sufficient resources so you could express the language in okay. Not assuming very much, but also not trivial. And then finally, um, you know, it can be nothing supernatural about the grasp of the subject's language and what he means when he speaks. Um, he's not just you know, like a parrot who is sounding syntactically well-formed noises, right? He understands what he's saying. But um, there must be a naturalistic account of how he understands what he says. And that means uh, in this kind of model that the relation between the expression in his language and the kind of content that he grasps is recursive. Again, this is not a very strong but it is exactly a limitation to keep, you know, to, to honor the fact that we are talking about an embodied subject who does not have resources that are uh, that go beyond the resources that it would be possible, intensible for a computer or another sort of similar mechanism to have. Now, um, the target for the representation will be, of course, first of all, that language that we're talking about, and then the beliefs that is. Uh, subject omega has. And they will be represented by a set of sentences. Um, first of all, the sentences to which this subject would extend upon proper questioning, those are explicit beliefs, and then everything that follows from those which are the implicit beliefs. Beginning to take shape as a, a little model of a cognitive subject. Hmm. Now, when I talked, when I said at the beginning that you know first person language is important, um, I was really alluding already to something else about language that I will have to emphasize now. Um, but then we will come back to it when it starts really playing a role. Um, I make a distinction between expressing and stating. So um, you can express a feeling by saying "ouch." You can also state "I'm in pain." Right? So you can express something and you can state that it is the case. But that's true also about beliefs. If I just say, you're a good class, I've expressed my belief. 
And but I could also make a statement and say, you want to know about, about my beliefs? Yeah, one thing, I believe that the earth is flat. And the scientific and believe things like that. <laughs> right? yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, you can express uh, beliefs that they are sending to the sentence. You can also express it by sending to the sentence, I believe that in, and finally you can also state the fact that you do have the belief. Um, now, if you're just thinking about the expressing of the belief, if you would express the belief that the Earth is flat, you will also have to ascend to, I believe that the Earth is flat. Okay, it will not really make sense for you to say, the Earth is flat, if I don't believe it. Right? Or I believe the Earth is flat, but maybe it's not. Right? Um, so, in the expression of belief, there is this back and forth between the sentence and the expression of belief in that sentence. Expression of belief in the sentence goes back and forth to the expression of belief in the belief of the sentence. Okay. Um, this is uh, part of the motivation for uh, a treatment of this very subject, of this kind of model, by Richmond Thomason, who then proved the theorem of ours. He proved the no go theorem. He said, in effect, he says, um, suppose the investigator's data forms a series represented precisely from the belief. So we have this set of sentences that form the theory. Um, and now, if principles one and two are general theorems in that theory, then it's inconsistent. The first one looks pretty innocuous. Do I believe that A? Do I believe that I believe that A? The second one looks a little bit more dicey, right? I believe that I believe A or A. I should also mention that the inconsistency is only there if the subject or the belt believes it in Now, if we think of the face value, policy was building on results by Mendeley and Kaplan, and um, let just go back to results by Gurdle and so on. It's a beautiful article. Um, it looks like a face value that he has uh, given a, a terrible goal to the whole project of this kind of public discovery. Uh, because if this is the right, if this is the right what you would the investigate the statement say, you could either say, oh yeah, well, I'm sorry, I can only represent uh, subjects that don't believe in anything. That's a bit of a problem, right? Or you could say, well, I just have to try to find out that everybody who believes there is a state that is inconsistent. That would be a bit of a problem out for the theory, too. Okay. So, however, you can argue against principle two. And this was, I think, a good quote that I wrote to Mr. Thomas and say, principle two is just tenable, and I tell you why the motivation for it is not right. And I wrote that in 2011, so you can read it. But I can explain how we can argue about it. The argument is against the motivation that Thomason and also various other people like Jakob Hintzka and so on so on, gave for this kind of principle. Um, it has to do with what I said before. If you express a belief, then you can't very well not ascend to the expression of the belief that you have that belief. Um, it would be absurd to say, I believe it's raining and decaying, but in fact it's not raining. Or vice versa. Uh, it's raining and decaying, but I don't believe it. You're taking away with one hand with what, you, what you gave us with the other. Now, their argument is, oh, given that that's absurd, you cannot deny that you believe if I believe it in a. Because it would be absurd to deny that. The denial would be, I believe a, but not a. Now, I think that many of you, people, it's familiar to many of you, under the name of Moore's Paradox. Um, it's absurd. It's an absurdity that Moore pointed out in an article by Russell, uh, in a saying like, it's raining and decaying, but I don't believe it, or I believe it, but it isn't so. But you know what? This is a paradox in first person in first person language. And that is really crucial. Okay. Um, I said before that 
to be trying to apply ordinary classical logic to first person language, you get in trouble. Now, in ordinary logic, you know, we have the principle that if the conjunction of A and of B is absurd, then A and by B. If we now take that and apply it to this, uh, this word paradox, we would have to go through the Pythagorean chain that I that I believe it is, or, and also if I believe it is, then it is. So it's going to be saying that only if I believe that it's going to be chain. Well, that's the claim that I'm saying. Wait, obviously wrong, right? So if you if you treat Moore's paradox absurdity as a logical inconsistency and apply logic, you get this out into an inconsistency, right? Because you will have to deny that surely. Okay. So the motivation for this principle two is not good. Okay. But we have to try and make sense of what this motivation is. And um, again, I will make the distinction between expressing and stating. And now it becomes, of course, more, more important because it's part of the argument. Um, let me give a couple of examples. Uh, a few more examples of what I mean by this distinction between expressing and stating. Okay, it's a sort of um, distinction that already came up in various forms in medieval logic. Um, in medieval logicians um, explored, for example, the subject of the logic of promises, and their examples were always like horses. So suppose somebody said to his friend, "I promise you a horse for your birthday." And then the birthday comes, and the friend says, horse, and no, no horse. But you've done something heinously morally wrong. You have broken a promise to your friend. And the guy says, no, no, no. What I said at the time was false. I was lying. And I said, I, was, and I, said, I promise you, I was lying. I was, I was making a statement of fact that was false. So it's true that I'm guilty of lying, but not of the terrible thing of making a promise to my friend. <laughs> now, you know, when I was when I was a graduate student in Pittsburgh, we had a real case of this. Uh, <laughs> uh, we had a, a chief of police who was apparently getting a very large income outside of the salary. And there was a federal investigation of this. And he claimed that, well, he was going to West Virginia to the racetrack, never get more than five dollars to begin with. Right? Nobody believed him. But um, he made a deposition under oath uh, that began, I hereby say that I have never taken any drive, and so on. And then somebody came forward and he said, yes, I brought brown paper bags and a dollar bill to you. Okay, so the IRS tried to get him on perjury. His lawyer got him off. Because his lawyer said he only swore to the fact that he hereby stated that he had <laughs> now, it, <laughs> this is a different with expressing and stating because <laughs> you know you're supposed to have right, that's a fine. So um the <laughs> um now that was his work at that point. Um I'll give you one more example, maybe a little bit more typical. Um, suppose you hear me say something like this. The dean seems to be acting more and more strangely every day. Think that we probably need to think of this in a context in which that could be an expression of belief on my part. Right? But maybe we're wrong about the context. It's more that it was fair to say in the therapist's office, my therapist had me there, and I say that, and my therapist reacts with, Has this confession become stronger during the last two days? Now, what's happened here? The therapist is not taking it as an expression of belief. He is taking that statement about my mental state right? as autobiographical information that I'm referring to. So, what's important is that, first of all, as we all know, the very same words can have ambiguity in different linguistic contexts. In this particular case, a first person statement can have the linguistic function of expressing a belief or of stating an autobiographical fact. 
And these two functions are not the same. And they don't have the same logic. When, uh, when uh, the first person language is simply used for stating, so that the word I just has the same law as the word what I'm talking, there's no logical problem, right? The ordinary logic applies. But when the first person language is used to express, then the ordinary logic is not applied. So, what do we have to do in order to improve on Thomas's model? We have to say that there are two different consequence relations. Uh, there's the ordinary logical consequence relation of a valid argument that deserves a proof, and there is the kind of following of chain of incoherence that can hold between expressions of belief. And Moore's paradox has to do with that. So we have one syntax, in other words, the very same words are used, the very same expressions are used, but they can be used for stating, and then full classical logic applies, or they can be used for expressing. And I have, I mean, there are, in principle, many different ways that it's logician to make up languages that might act like that. The one that I'm in favor is that you use super evaluations, which is a simple way to do it. Um, you can either think of it as two languages that sound the same, or you can think of it as one language with two consequence relations in it, because the words in that language have two different functions. Right? Uh, and you have to disentangle the ordinary logical inference that you get a proof, and the other one that is following the chain of incoherence. Now, I think we're in a position to improve on this model. So, um, because there's a difference between the stating and the expression, and for the statements of what is believed, um, the uh, word paradox is not uh, in play. Um, the argument for that second principle of Thomason is just not a good argument to be rejected. But now what we have to do is we have to bring in the model a representation of the beliefs that represents how they are expressed, the express, the expressed beliefs. So investigators say that now Thomas' theory represents precisely all of those set of beliefs. And he has to use the third person language to do this. He has to say things like omega ascends to A, omega believes that A. Uh, which is true if proper correction is elicited to send to A, and then to I believe A. Um, and Omega believes A, that's true exactly if A is in the set of beliefs of Omega, uh, exactly if the sentence I believe A is also in the set of beliefs, which is the case if only if Omega believes the semantic content of I believe A, but look to the same term, Omega and I. Okay? Not to, be, not to be conflated here, so that you never get to Thomas's second principle. So the investigators say that there's no time in inconsistency if he doesn't conclude a complete omega belief and I believe. But it's dangerous. Thomas's paradox can come back to both of us. What if the investigator says, I have now this beautiful general model for cognitive subjects? Cognitive subjects, you have a language in which they can um, express uh, arithmetic, for example. Um, a beautiful model of the, of the subject's language and beliefs that really takes account of the difference between stating and expressing. I'm going to offer it to the world as a general model for cognitive subjects. And then he says, well, I'm a cognitive subject. This model applies to me. I have representation here of, you know, of my own language and my own beliefs. And if he does that, if he identifies himself as a target of the description, well, self-identification of that sort is not a simple thing, but at least it has to imply that there's a harmony there will have to be a harmony between what he states that his beliefs are and the beliefs he expresses. So then there's going to be a back and forth between expression and stating that there wasn't there before. And we can deduce some of principle. And so now, the cognitive scientist 
have learned in the example of the next national. Not as long as he was representing another side subject, but when he said, yeah, this represents me. At this point, he's talking to Christian language and expressing a belief about the world. Um, you know, I think that uh, the form of belief is not in any, in any way a difficult one. Physicists have physical models of the have models in physics of the world, they certainly think it's part of the world they live in. They have um, models of mechanical systems and they say, yeah, I'll fight to me too. If you drop me out of the window, I fall. Right? So it's not as if scientists have to go, have to stay away from saying, yeah, the models we have represent us in general. But when it comes to this kind of self-perception of a, a concept of ourselves as a cognitive agent, which is in all respects no better than a computer, he contradicts himself. So, you know, we can now refer the two first parts, right? There's only a small third part coming. The two first parts. The first part says, if I try to conceive of myself as an unlimited intellect, sort of Descartes style, I run into self-contradiction. If I try to conceive of myself as rather like a computer, a limited physical being, it's mechanical, way of working, I land into self-contradiction. I do not form a coherent self-conception either way. So why are we in the matrix? <laughs> I, I think uh, the kind of argument that I've given, you know, may very well remind you of the sort of thing that the British idealists would do. British idealists would start with quite ordinary conceptions of what our experience is like. About time, about space, about relations, about, the, about separateness, distinction between beings, and so on. And um, then they would reduce inconsistency. MacTaggart, Bradley, Rosen Gay, I don't know how you know them, but probably everybody has heard about them. Staggered, right? So they concluded that we live in appearance, not reality. We live in the realm of illusion. Because the, the, we have no, the world we live in must be appearance rather than reality because we have no way of consistently describing it to ourselves. So am I doing that sort of thing? No, I'm not. I'm definitely not. Um, because what I arrived at is a pragmatic incompetence. Exactly the sort of incoherence that is signaled by Moore's paradox. And that can only appear in first person language. Now, of course, we're not going to give up on first person language. We're not going to give up on the idea that we can speak intelligibly about ourselves in the first person. But when we try to form this coherent conception of ourselves in either of the two ways that I examined, we arrive at a pragmatic incoherence, the kind of incoherence of most paradox. And specifically, you know, once we have revised Richmond Thomason's argument, is apparent in this group of problems of science who say, no, no, that's not what it is. Um, we have to look at the possibility of a model that, you know, Take expression when it's taking the state into account. Um, we did, we, okay, we, we solved that problem, right? We solved that problem in science, it's totally impossible. No, no, not at all. Um, but Moore's paradox writ large came back with a cross of scientists with this kind of model that says, This is my self conception. Right? Um, I can understand myself in the sense that I can set up a science, a scientific model of myself. So this is the diagnosis that I want to offer and uh, see what kind of reaction you have. I, I think that the conclusion we have to come to is that, yeah, um, self understanding oneself is possible, but it cannot be consist with having a factual theory about what we are. Um, if I try to represent myself, myself as a system of determining possible states, etc., 
I come to the picture of the barrier. Um, and this, so this is an argument against metaphysical realism. It's not an argument against any particular thesis of metaphysical realism. But rather, it's an argument against the conviction that is behind metaphysical realism, which is exactly this understanding of this in having a true theory about what things are like. Back to true theory. Having a back to true theory is what it is to have an understanding. That understanding is, is knowledge. Now, knowledge is understanding, if you like to put it that way. That, I think, is what that comes apart here. Um, there's no primitive, this is to say, you, you don't understand ourselves at all, right? So you can't. There will be no primitive if I'm not going to resolve at this point. Um, but it raises a challenge for philosophy that it's not easy to see how you can address. Because if it's not by writing theories in the way that the mathematician does, and the way that the scientist does, and the way that many people in epistemology do about us, um, then what is it going to be? How are we going to articulate our sense of self? How are we going to articulate any kind of self-understanding? Well, we're not going to do it by going after these familiar phenomenons about zombies or brains in bats or identity conditions for the self, etc. that you know club in the literature. All of those are just examples of trying to write theories of the sort that the cognitive scientists could do much better. Well, I think there have been ten moments in philosophy, and even if I don't know exactly how to go on from there, I think that we have to take our cue. So, we're all about self, we're all about self application we're all about first person language, okay? One that I've been talking about is Lewis Carroll Ross, with the conclusion that to express is not the same, to express a belief is not the same as stating that you have it, expressing a belief is not the same as autobiographical statement. Making, right? Um, there are examples um, in the literature, uh, John Perry and David Kaplan have these examples of people who, in a certain situation, know all the facts, but don't realize that the facts are about them. They can, they can attribute them themselves to them. So, David Kaplan has an example of a man who doesn't realize he's looking in the mirror, and he says, Hey, that guy, his pants are on fire. Now, he doesn't realize it's him. So he doesn't react in the way that he would if you were saying, my pants are on fire, right? Because he knows all the facts. That man pants are on fire, but he can't tell us, he can't identify. Um, but the first example that I know of in the history of philosophy is actually quite some time ago. And that's Kant in the uh, paper the, that he was called On the Distinctions of Reason in Space. He talks about an astronomer who has a complete and accurate map of the heavens. And he says, but if he can't orient himself in respect to the map, and he doesn't know whether the sun will come up on the left or on the right. Now, left and right are really first-person ideas, right? Left of me, right of me. Right? Um, so Kant there is, in that paper, a couple of hundred years ago, bringing up the fact that first-person language is irreducible, not so have the same logic as fact statements. You know, you probably know, some of you probably know the statement by Thomas Nagel called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? It's very difficult to understand what it's like to be a bat. But I want to say it's even more difficult to understand what it's like to be us. Um, I exist, but I'm not a thing. I'm not a thing, but I'm not nothing. I am both inseparable from the world and not gripped by the world. That thesis is true, I think, when it comes to our self-perception. We can we have to conceive of ourselves as part of the world, but not as in the world, but not of the world in some sense. Seems to be the only reaction to have, but it can only be the very beginning of a philosophical, proper philosophical reaction.
have some time for questions for Professor Valkoff. So you wanted to say something? No. What? John. Um, what did uh, it be saying that the I is definitely indispensable to the vowel or something? The vowel. The I and the vowel. Mm -hmm. I do. When one refers to one's I, I, there's an analogy, of course, with type theory. Mm -hmm. Right, which is not true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean that the the eye itself in your analogy is really rather like the whole hierarchy of types. Mm -hmm. Or of course, which are definitely extensible, and we know we can get the contradictions, including similar ones to what they yeah, there. Similar. But each type, each type level, on the other hand, the key, the, 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 the vow seems to be functioning at, at some definite type level within the, 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 the ego's perception, which is the regards itself as a and, and the, the he, or the, the vow, if you want, uh, is something that should be grasped completely by the eye, at least as, as, as part of its own thing, in other words, as a, as a type level within this hierarchy. Where, of course, the, the paradoxes don't apply, because universal statements uh, about he, right, about the right, just go up on type level, but not, of course, for he. Uh, unless you treat the unless you treat the him as, as an I, right? I mean that's the subtlety here that you can actually, of course, say, well, why can't the he? Of course, the he will treat itself it, itself as an I. I yeah, it, 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 which is no. no, no, which makes it different from the simple type theoretic explanation yeah. of what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean the subtlety is that the one subtlety mm -hmm. is, of course, that you have I and thou. I mean, remember, Bile makes this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I, but I see in, in vow the I. Right? I mean, in other words, what is, is for me also is the thing, at, at some level, for you. And yet, that's really not directly expressible. This is a mechanical language that I think, I think that is, uh, you know, that, that you, you actually isolated. I, I think that there is uh, a problem that comes up in many different ways. I mean, could you paraphrase your question? What was the question? Um, um, paraphrase your question. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a specific question, but it was about the analogy with type theory and in the uh, book that, right? And uh, there you can have a hierarchy of types, and at any, any given level, your opponent requires that you have everything that's there so far, you have never set your problem, right? But, um, or you can think of that sentence with the type, but in the sense that there are nice and structured with different types, then it would be sense to make such a sense, right? But then, of course, type theory itself can only express in that language. That's right. right? Um, now, I was going to be linked to this poem by saying this sort of problem applies in many places. We, we make up a model, and it's impossible to have certain propositions about the model represented in the model. Um, uh, another place where that happens is that, uh, for instance, with respect to Bacon. You know, um, whether or not somebody is short, that can be a vague, it can be vague. I mean, somebody could be a four line. But then you come to somebody and I say, now, um, is he short or is he a four line of short? I say, well, I'm not sure he's a four line of short. I mean, I, I can't, you know, if you think he's a four line of short, then I, right? so there's a vagueness of vagueness problem, right? And, well, it could be that something is infinitely vague. You know, there's something you cannot prove, which you don't see in any part of the steps. Identify on the spectrum. But if you were to step outside the language of the spectrum, you could say that, but you couldn't say it in the um, So, you know, that sounds very, very easy to deal with. Yeah, as long as you say that's not our language, it's the one we're talking about. But the moment I say yes, but listen, isn't that supposed to apply to the language, to my language? We get to the stop and make it. Um, so I, I think that uh, what John is pointing out is just that these uh, paradoxes, which I think have not been appreciated very much in postmodern models. No, uh, no, that's very interesting. I mean, I've never seen. It yeah. never occurred to me. Yeah. <laughs> you can treat complete high yeah. hierarchy as a key. Right. 
you suggested. Uh, he's allowed to be oh, no, You suggested the soup evaluation. Yeah. And the rotation. Now, when that would do, you would just do the gap. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And so, is that how how much progress toward a quantum dissolution do you think mm -hmm. that is? Well, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's a simple solution, but it fits very nicely to represent in the leaf because there are many cases where you don't have the leaf and you don't have the option to revive it. So you have a standard of belief, standard of disbelief, and no standard at all. And that's what the super evaluation was designed to handle. Um, and then um, you can, uh, in that kind of language, you can have these non classical inferential connections. You know, for instance, two propositions and, and similar ones. So that the word paradox, uh, word paradox points out the strange connection between sentences about the value of the and the Those can be represented in non classical and logical connections. Yeah. But so far, the questions are technical. Does anybody have a question about this now? Yeah, why have a, a, a broad methodological question? I guess. Okay. Uh, One way that you can take the results as well, here's the uh, interesting technical results to get the uh, metal object and look what they tell us about uh, philosophy of mind. Mm. Uh, and the philosophers of mind have not been paying attention. Right. Uh, but uh, a maybe more pessimistic way of looking at it is this is another reason for thinking that technical work with the metal object and consistency theory and so forth doesn't really apply to the actual human mind themselves, um, and that, uh, you know, uh, that human cells and human minds just aren't creatures like that, so that the, the work is well, well, you know, well, you know, I think we have to be a little bit careful here. Um, there was a philosopher called uh, Lucas, um, who wrote some famous arguments to the fact that um, we are clearly greater in some sense than any possible computer. His arguments are all invalid. Okay? And I'm not making any argument like that. Right? I'm not saying that this is an argument for supercomputer capacities that the human being has. No, no, I'm not. Um, it, what, I'm, what I'm focusing on is how do we try to get an understanding of ourselves? Now, I think there's a great value in scientific models. Right? I, I, absolutely, and this is what we should do with every subject. We should have scientific models. But we shouldn't start equating understanding with having the model of truth. Because understanding and interpretation are cannot consist in that. Um, and as I say, my logical friend is saying, we still have understanding, we cannot understand ourselves. I don't think that's correct. I just think that the way in which that I think that an alternative that takes seriously is that there's a philosophical enterprise that is not carried on by other philosophers, which does get into self-understanding, but it doesn't do it in the same way. But that's a suggestion, okay? I mean, I know that what is it? The good news is we can have against it, but we have to go in and have to look at existential. Yeah, I suppose my question is slightly different way. So what would what the reaction uh, of the scientists often have to uh, philosophers' truths about uh, paradoxes we fall into is, well, for instance, the human mind is really subject to closure. We just don't draw all the implications out of uh, our, our beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so the results, interesting as they may be, about the human mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I don't know about the human mind, but you can certainly get out of paradoxes by saying, I'm going to limit what I try to do. So I don't make a small piece of anything to make a small piece of No problem. Okay? And the small piece can get bigger and bigger. Um, you can, you know, um, if you limit your, your target and limit what you want to represent, Limit what kind of model you want, you don't need to stop by the problem. No question. Right? Um, 
but um, I don't think that in but, but this is what this is what I would say to the common scientists. I don't want to say that it's a philosopher. A philosopher should not say that he is a that kind of uh, scientific enterprise. Um, that's what a scientist should be doing, not a philosopher. The philosopher has to has to raise the further questions about yes, but apart from what you can do because you're saying is safe, how should you think about that? Right. Um, and you know, it's very easy to dismiss from history from logic. Um, saying, yeah, I don't definitely understand that if I, if I look at what the results are, I don't think that's true, I don't understand it, but come oh, on, it's not a fact, it's not something now. You know, AKA at one point was uh, supported by a logician who was just, I don't do stuff. <laughs> I don't do stuff. <laughs> now, this is not the right reaction, it seems to me, for a philosopher to have against the innovation. Scientific theories are and should be written in third person language. So, scientific theory is not going to run into this problem. Uh, the problem is going to, going to start when the scientists start writing some popular science that sounds philosophical and then ask people that take, like, you know, we are computers. Right? Um, and this, you know, this, <laughs> this always happens, you know, when uh, I when I used to teach introductory philosophy, I would begin to say there's five of them. And one after the other, you get these theories about what we are like. And of course, one of them has to be that there are a certain set of mechanisms. The most sophisticated technology at the time was music instruments. So one of the students said, no, they're just like wire, you know, a, a musical instrument. Um, I'm sure that, you know, it went on that day every time, you know, in some of Descartes and Clockworks, uh, or some from the yacht and had a clock, right? Then probably somebody said, really, there's steam engines, right? Or like <laughs> electromagnetic mechanisms, you know? And now they're saying they're computers, right? It's the philosophical implications that are in trouble. Um, as long as they say, I have a nice computer model of human, of human cognitive capacities of a certain sort, fine, right? Um, if the, I can conceive of myself as simply a computer, that you get in the popular literature, that I think is really mistaken. Maybe? I, I think I'm very well see what you're saying. Um, 
There may be actual reasoning, but that's been modeled based on classical logics. Maybe not the material values. Yes. But, but I don't think there's a, an easy way out of the uh, problems that I think Thomas brings up. Because his arguments are entirely given in a third person classical language. Uh, in, the, in the, the sort of language that the logician has, you know, studied and set aside for, for a meta theory. Um, so the um, the arguments have to be in classical logic. So the arguments of reason and contradiction, they have to be in classical logic because they are just in a language that is purely descriptive about the representation in which you see the representation of belief logic that is not classical. So, um, I, I, I see the worry that you're pointing out, but I, I think that there's not an easy way out of that. Thank you. 
let the, the big round of applause.